Friday, everyone. It is 2.30. Welcome to CCDPH, Schools and COVID-19 Weekly Update. My name is Kelly Jones. I am a senior health educator with Cook County Health Department in the Community Engagement and Health Education Unit. I am your host and facilitator for our weekly webinars. Let's get started. We want to always go over our objectives. I'm so sorry. I usually turn my email off and I forgot. I'll make sure I do that. We usually go over our objectives, which are to provide updates and support to schools while navigating COVID-19, answer any frequently asked questions, and provide CCDPH contact information and resources. A couple announcements. We are making changes to our schedule at the beginning of 2022. Can you believe that we're there already? Beginning at the beginning of the year, our first session will be January 7th. We will then begin bi-weekly meetings. So January 7th will be our first meeting back after our holiday break, and we will start bi-weekly meetings. So if you go into the Eventbrite and try to register, you will see those changes that are made. So just to let everyone know, we'll continue to make those announcements as we head into the new year. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded to CCDPH's YouTube page. Feel free to look at them at your leisure or use it for reference if you need it. We start promptly at 2.30. We normally ask you to mute your line, but we've been muting that for you just to make sure that everyone views the presentation without any interruptions. And our chat was also disabled until we get to our Q&A session. Here is contact information if you need that to report your line list any webinar related questions, reporting communicable diseases. Here's information on our Cook County Health Department website, our school specific website, and any tools that you may want to print, print and post in your facility. If your school's in need of EpiPens, they can get that from me. Email me, kjones1 at cookcountyhhs.org. Please make sure all your requests are typed and that they come from a medical professional, i.e. your school nurse, or have the person who is certified and trained on the administration of medication. CCDPH is able to offer PPE to organizations. There's various PPE that we are able to give out, and you can email and go to our website for more information. We'd like to know uh, how we can help you get your school supported in uh, your vaccination process. So if you wouldn't mind filling out that survey, we greatly appreciate it. Just a little update on our outreach efforts right now, today and tomorrow, we are at Sauk Village Community Center, which is right behind the police station from 11 to 4. We were there a couple of weeks ago, so now we're offering second doses, first doses, boosters. Anybody who wants to come out is welcome. Age five and up, minors must be accompanied by their uh, parent or guardian. And also anyone 16 and older who comes to get their first dose will get a hundred dollar gift card. So that's great incentives. And if you look at the picture, our Cook County Sheriff's Department was there last time and they are there again with the Comfort Dogs, which is a really great program. The officer is amazing. So any child mostly, but anyone who was just feeling anxious or scared or nervous about getting their vaccine, the dog was, was on it. And the officer was really good about helping the kids feel comfortable and approaching the dog. So it was a great, great service that they were able to provide. Also, Cook County Health Department will be at Leak and Sons Repass Center in Country Club Hills next weekend in association with other community ride um, funeral home directors. We will be there from 10 to 6, and there is a gift card associated with this um, vaccination event, a $100 gift card for anyone 5 and up who receive their first, first dose. That's just a sampling of our uh, CCDPH sponsored events. If you go to our calendar, which is, this is a screenshot you see here of our calendar, you'll see the events that we have going on. Now that we're going into the new year and our vaccination, um, our vaccination efforts are rolling. We're gonna slow down and not be doing as many uh, Cook County Health Department sponsored events, but we will be sponsoring events with our community partners, as you can see on the screenshot here. If you would like to request a school clinic for your organization, you can click the link or email the following people on the page. And here's just some information on how to host a free vaccine event. It gives you some tips and some tools to host those events. Here's some educational resources and uh, links to our My Shot Toolkit 
vaccination page. We also did some videos for pediatric cases at our last vaccination event. So we wanna make sure that we cater those videos to everyone we are trying to reach. Here's some more information on our videos. And if your school has an existing COVID-19 testing program, we'd like to hear all about it. Please feel, feel free to hit that survey if you'd like. And Cook County Health Department is producing and, um, I'm sorry, not producing, we are involved in distributing the Binax rapid antigen test for Cook County. So if your organization is interested in using it and you have not filled out the waiver and gotten approved, please find the information at the following link and we'll be more than happy to get that information to you. If, you're, if your organization is interested in the shield saliva testing, you can email the dph.antigentesting at illinois.gov to make a request. And Beth Heller, who spoke to our group a couple months ago, will get you started with that process. If you want to have a speaker come to your organization about COVID-related subjects, you can fill out that request at the link. It'll ask you a few questions to make sure that we pair you with the most accurate professional for your needs. And if you know someone who needs a ride to their vaccination appointment or in-home vaccination, they can call the 833-308-1988 number. It's also for people who are homebound. It's only suburban Cook County, not in the city of Chicago, Skokie, Evanston, Oak Park, or Stickney, as they have their, have their own separate health departments. That is all, and I'm going to toss it to Lex. Thank you all very much. Thanks so much, Kelly. Everybody, hang on just one second while I get my screen pulled up. So today um, is going to be the last chance for you to take um, the survey where you can provide feedback to tell us how we're doing with these, what you'd like to see covered and things like that. Go over the usual metrics, um, talk about Omicron, um, talk about home testing and go over some of the submitted questions that we had and also just things that have been popping up in our inbox really frequently that we wanted to address. So just as you guys know, um, as is routine for you guys uh, at this point in time, obviously urgent outbreaks are going to be our first priority answering emails um, and then case reporting, contact reporting um, and guidance um, after that. Um, it would be really helpful if in the uh, subject line you could put whether it's uh, reports that you're sending an outbreak or that you need guidance just because we have different people doing different things and it's easier to grab those emails out of the inbox for your designated uh, jobs. So um, just wanted to mention that when you're contacting us, it's basically the same information. Um, also, just to point out, um, if you don't do this before you ask for guidance, I think a lot of you already do. But <laughs> this is honestly how I find a lot of things to myself. Like you can just Google IDPH school COVID guidance and a bunch of different options will come up for you. If you've got a keyword like music, put it in quotation marks, you'll be able to find what you're looking for. Just a good, more efficient search tip if you haven't been doing that already. So here is the link to the survey and the QR code. Um, I've noticed that and for one question, um, we ask if there are any topics that you guys would like to see covered when we're wrapping up the pandemic in the future, the elusive future. Um, and a lot of people have said yes, but not told us what topics they would like to see. So if you did have something specific in mind, please go back there and tell us what you would like to see covered. Or if you have more specific COVID things you'd want to see covered, what is a school's jurisdiction and what is CCDBH's jurisdiction? or um, going over how the variants are different from each other, things like that, please let us know. And we'll try to get that information in our next webinars. All right, so moving on with what's new, we obviously have a really large uptick in cases. We're starting to see stuff from Thanksgiving already, um, but we're gonna continue to see that for the next like two to four weeks, and then we're gonna hit Christmas. Um, and other winter holidays. So we, we are gonna continue to see this uptick that we're seeing. You can see um, in the IDPH graph here in the bottom right, that kind of at the beginning of the school year, ages five to 11 started to overtake the older age groups, which is where we were seeing the majority of cases before. Um, so it is really important for all the eligible 5 to 11 year olds to get vaccinated, especially as we approach the holidays, at least by Christmas and New Year's, um, they should be fully vaccinated. I know by Thanksgiving, they weren't fully vaccinated. Um, but also, I do want to shout out 
Cook County is doing a really great job getting the youth vaccinated. Um, at least what a seventy four percent have at least one dose, and almost seventy percent are fully vaccinated. That's really great. Um, love to see it. Keep pushing for that. That's what's going to help us have in person school during this winter surge that we're seeing. Specifically for Cook, our weekly case count is up. Our test positivity is way up, um, despite the fact that we are testing a lot and very frequently. Um, we are in a very high level of community transmission, and our percent of the total population who are completely vaccinated has slightly increased. We do have a good chunk of the outbreaks in the state, but that's to be expected with our population size. Um, so there's 180 outbreaks all over the state in schools, and we've got 57 of them. So that's where we're at metrics wise. Here we are travel wise. Right now, uh, the Gulf slash Southern states are actually doing pretty well. Um, but we would be considered orange with the rest of the Northern part of this map. I'm not convinced that this, these yellow states will stay yellow for long. Um, as we discuss Omicron, you'll know that in some of them, uh, that variant has already been detected. So um, this is where we're at. As a reminder, if someone isn't fully vaccinated, it is not recommended that they travel to any of these orange states and absolutely not recommended for them to travel internationally unless it is a really important, you know, like family situation. Um, and I'm not just talking uh, the holidays, I'm talking like an emergency. So try to limit travel for those who aren't vaccinated or to see or for people who are immunocompromised, um, you know, limit travel in those circumstances as well. There was an update to international travel guidance this week in light of a new variant. Um, so it used to be that um, you had more time to be tested before you traveled back to the US on your flight, um, regardless of your vaccination status. And now it has to be within one day of arrival. The CDC was talking some stricter uh, measures and they said they're still discussing those. But as of right now, the only thing that's going into effect Let's see, yeah, on Monday the 6th uh, is that that negative test result has to occur within one day of international travel. And we've had a couple of travel questions in light of Thanksgiving. Um, so for vaccinated individuals, what is absolutely required is to self monitor your symptoms for a full quarantine period, those 14 days. It is recommended pretty strongly that um, a follow up test whether that's a home test or one in school that's part of the screening program occur if you're vaccinated um if that's possible that's great but for unvaccinated individuals they should be tested three to five days um, for students they can return immediately after travel but they should still get tested they can attend school while they're waiting for those results but it is really recommended that they get tested um and while they're attending, and if they start to feel sick, absolutely, they need to be excluded. So that's kind of where we're at with students. The guidance from IDPH says like, if they must travel, but as we all know, um, it's not like when you're a minor and your parents say you're gonna go see your family in Indiana for the holidays, you have much of a choice uh, to stay home. So um, that is a situation where travel was a must for that person. So, um, that uh, return to school the next day is fine for students. Obviously, as I've said before, we're not keeping track of where everybody in Cook County is. That is impossible. Um, so we don't expect schools to know where everybody is going either. But um, we are hoping that people are doing the right things and schools are sending out, you know, like if you're traveling, maybe stay home for this period of time or go and get tested kind of letters. Um, IDPH has some as an example on the ISB site, I believe. Um, so that's where we're at with travel guidance, um, which is just extra important now that we're in the holiday season. Okay, so what do we know about the Omicron variants? The short answer is we don't know a whole lot for sure yet. Um, the first thing is that the reason we're concerned about it is the location and the number of mutations on the genome predict basically that it will have a better ability to um, knock out binding sites where the antibodies would normally grab onto the virus and also 
um, allow them, the virus, to bind more tightly to human cells in the respiratory tract. So basically, easier access to the body and also evading your immune system. This, these are hypotheses um, based on the mutations of previous variants and what they did. So that has yet to be totally proven, but that is the biggest reason why we're concerned because it could impact um, your immunity from vaccination or a previous infection. It's unknown at the moment how Omicron is going to be um, resistant or sensitive to our current antibodies. Preliminary cases, um, there's been a couple scattered around the US, um, seem to show that existing vaccine antibodies um, still provide really good protection against severe disease, hospitalization, and death. We still don't know about general infections because we don't have enough recorded uh, cases to know. But the cases that have been vaccinated and still managed to get Omicron, um, there was like an anime convention in New York where that happened. Um, that was reported this week and that person already recovered. The vaccines still provide really good protection against more severe outcomes. So we do know that, which is great. So cases have been found in California, New York, Colorado, Minnesota, and um, are likely in several other states already. Um, we just uh, didn't necessarily start looking for them um, as soon as you know they started popping up. Um, some cases were related to travel outside the country. That California case um, was a travel related to South Africa, but there is some indication that there's already a, some level of community spread. Um, in, I am gonna be honest, I do not totally know how to pronounce this, in, Guateng, uh, South Africa, um, which is the most populous uh, province in South Africa, the Omicron variant quickly overtook the existing variants, and that includes Delta, um, that were circulating. Um, and that's one of the reasons we're concerned about it, um, because of how quickly it was able to overtake Delta, which in our minds was already um, such a heavy hitter. So, um, also, in a study that hasn't been peer reviewed yet that I've put in the bottom, if you wanted to read it, um, there's potential for an increased risk of reinfection compared to earlier variants. Um, that's from data from South Africa. So uh, it hasn't been peer reviewed yet. That's kind of a hypothesis. Um, but there is a lot of data that shows that there is an, probably an increased risk for reinfection. Um, but the good news is um, vaccine makers can and are ready to adapt any kind of booster doses of their vaccines to the variant and it will not be that difficult for them to do that so if it becomes a real problem um we you know people are ready to deal with it um and that's the honestly the greatest thing about mrna technology um that you can change it um when you've got all these variants that are popping up such a such a cool thing that people have developed Finally, routine testing doesn't indicate usually which variant someone in, is infected with. So like just your routine testing in schools or when you take a swab at the doctor's office, typically samples then need to be sent to labs to be sequenced. And so you're not gonna know right away if you've got Omicron, but um, IDPH and all the labs across the country are planning to alter um, how their testing is because there are certain indicators um, that you potentially have the Omicron variant and then you can send it away for sequencing. So um, continue to do your regular programs. If there is a change that applies to schools with testing, I will let you know. Um, but the good news is, you know, the tests are still going to be just fine in detecting Omicron. Um, so that's where we're at with that. No need to panic about it, but it does mean we're going to have a winter surge that is... Um, you know, not what we were hoping for. All right, and because this week we've gotten a lot of questions on home tests, I just wanted to go over them. I believe, um, I'm not sure if this was an executive order, but I, I heard on NPR this morning that the Biden administration is um, trying to have uh, health insurances cover or reimburse people for home tests to make them more accessible. Um, so I expect to see that there's going to be more and more home testing. I've gotten a home test a time or two when I had a sinus infection, but just wanted to err on the side of caution. Um, so let's just go over home tests real quick. So a negative at home test result. 
cannot exempt someone from quarantine and cannot shorten their quarantine um, if they have had known close contact um, with a case. It's also not accepted for travel requirements, so you can't get tested and then hop on a plane. Um, excuse me, hang on one second. So that's not required and a home test also cannot um, get someone to return to school after they've been symptomatic and um, they're, they're feeling better. You know, we're still only accepting PCR for that. So that's what a negative result can do. A positive test results, um, first and foremost, the biggest recommendation is to get a confirmatory lab-based PCR test um, to a positive at-home test. If they're able to do that within 48 hours of that at-home test and that PCR result ends up being negative, then we take that negative test result and act on that result. It supersedes that home test because home tests are just so much less accurate than PCR tests. But that is the only situation where that superseding is happening. If they don't go for a confirmatory test um, after that at-home positive, then we're going to treat them um, as if they are a case. We're going to ask them to isolate for 10 days. Um, their return has to be, you know, fever-free, diarrhea-free, all that good stuff. Um, and then that's also a situation where contact tracing is going to be required um, if they don't get a confirmatory test. Home test positives are only considered a probable case. And this is where we get into nitty-gritty epidemiology stuff. But um, they're only going to be considered a probable case if they have symptoms and have had close contact. So that's more about how it's going to be entered into INEDs and all of the contact tracing systems. So hopefully that answers a lot of your questions on home testing. There's also um, a really great link from the CDC, and they also um, recently posted videos of how to collect swabs. So if anyone ever has you know, any questions on how they're supposed to do that, they've got some great visuals. All right, a couple submitted questions. The first one uh, is that the FAQ state that unvaccinated students should not travel, but if they must, then they can return to school immediately, but must test five to seven days after returning from travel. I believe many of our families will be traveling over the holiday, not because they must, but because their families wish to travel. In the case of the unvaccinated student traveler to an orange state who is traveling for pleasure, can we allow them to return to school immediately and have them get tested later after returning from their travel? Yes, um, so they can return immediately and they really should get tested, um, but they can attend school while they're waiting for those results. Um, a lot of students don't really have much of a choice but to travel with their families for the holidays. Um, obviously, a minor just can't stay home on their own. Um, so in that situation, they can immediately return. We don't want to keep people out of school um, without really, really strong reasons. Second question, is any school COVID safety guidance changing as students age five and up become fully vaccinated? So with Omicron and with our current community transmission levels, there's not going to be changes anytime soon, but uh, we are working on creating guidance for schools with really high vaccination coverage among students and staff for when the community transmission is lower and we're not surging. So in the future, we're hoping, um, you know, we can give good privileges um, and help schools return to more normal times um, if they've got good vaccination coverage, but that is in, again, this elusive future <laughs> um, after this winter, probably. Um, how do you recommend we verify child COVID vaccination status when parents tell us my child is fully vaccinated? So far for students age 12 and up at the middle school level, we've been taking parents on their word. What are other school districts doing? Do you recommend we ask for a copy of their vaccination card? Um, so I just want to say when we open up the Q&A, if you have um, something that's really been working for your district, feel free to recommend it to this person who asked this question. But our answer at CCDPH is that ultimately schools get to decide how they choose to verify their vaccination records as long as it's obviously compliant with FERPA and HIPAA and protects um, the privacy of that student. Um, you can ask for a scan or to copy the vaccination card, that's fine. Um, but you can also utilize iCare and Vax Verify. I've gone through that system myself and it's pretty easy to use. Um, I've linked that here for when this gets sent out. Um, 
So that is what I would recommend. Those are those are built for you guys to use. Um, but it may be that collecting vaccination cards is easier. Um, keep in mind that people have been arrested for selling fake vaccination cards. So again, probably your best case is to use eye care, but I understand that um, that could be a barrier for some people. As usual, we've got references, um, how to handle outbreaks, the test to stay flow chart. Uh, remember, just a reminder for test to stay, first question you have to ask is, was everybody properly masked? If the answer is no, then there is no test to stay. Just a reminder of that we're accepting PCR, that could be rapid, um, but that is what we're accepting. We are not currently accepting antigen test results for return from having symptoms. Shield testing, which I know a lot of you are doing. What to do with a symptomatic household member. Uh, which quarantine option to use. Uh, guidance for sports and music. Uh, what to do when somebody is potentially experiencing side effects from uh, getting vaccinated, but it overlaps with potential COVID side effects. And then the daycare guidance if you're here from a day daycare or there's uh, one attached to your school district. All right, I'm going to stop sharing and take a look at the chat. All right. Oh, boy. Okay. So <laughs> give me a second to read this first question. I'm going to copy and paste it into my notes here just in case I need to go back and reference it later. So it looks like a student. Oh, and it looks like Michelle has posted a very great link for documentation. Um, if you guys have ever have like really specific scenarios, um, a good place to email them would be the CCDPH school email. Um, though that's like where you can really get into the nitty gritty of your situation. Um, if you needed any follow up, I just wanted to add um, the website. I read the questions. I'll answer them for you, Lex. Sure. Okay. Uh, Michelle, do you feel like that first one um, was sufficiently answered, or should we go over it? Um, I'm not. Sh we'll see if this person, because I want to see if we saw this in the email as well, so we could type a little bit more in the email. But SHU is one of those tests that pick up COVID a lot sooner than the other tests available, especially the antigen test. The antigen test pickup window is like zero, zero to seven days from onset of symptom, whereas she could pick up five days before they're symptomatic. So that window is a lot wider. So we almost always go with the shield test. So just FYI. Thanks, Michelle. I see um, we've been requiring vaccine cards for the person who asked about how to collect that information. Um, I have a younger sibling who's at U of I right now, and uh, there was a situation in his dorm where someone lied about their vaccine records, and then there was an outbreak, and they had to do outbreak testing. So that that does happen, and it does happen here, um, just so everybody knows. Um, and it looks like your website states uh, should continue to attend school in person. However, they should get tested three to five days after returning from their trip. Uh, so the five to seven days is um, the CDC IDPH recommendation, and that's fine. Um, but three to five days also meets that window. So basically, three to seven days after returning is fine. Um, you want to give it like a couple days um, in case you know the virus needs to build up to be detected. Um, but also, if it doesn't happen within seven days, that window has pretty much passed. Um, so, looks like vaccine verification. When it was just 12 and up, parents would enter dates and we would verify in eye care. Now that it's five and up, we're allowing parents to enter dates with an upload of their card into PowerSchool. I don't know what that is, but that sounds like a good method. Um, we also have extra people working our school clinics to upload vaccine cards right on site to ease school nurse burden. Wow, that is a great system you've got going on. All right. Are there any mobile testing resources for parents or families? I will toss this one to Kelly, actually. Do you have any idea if there's specific resources for families and not just um, schools? Pertaining to families that are afflicted with COVID? It looks like it. 
Sure. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, when we had uh, Jessica from our resource unit present, they are able to uh, assist families with different resources. So I will make sure I attach the flyer from her PowerPoint to these slides when I send them out. And it has our contact information. It has a little information about their program and what they're able to do for families. So I'll make sure I send that out. Just let me know if that answers your question or you need any more detailed. Uh, resources other than that. Thanks so much, Kelly. Okay, thanks. All right, to Michelle, if a fully vaccinated close contact to a household case has symptoms and subsequently tests negative, are they able to return to school? We would be treating them under row A, not, I'm sorry, not row A. We would be treating them under symptomatic um, close contact. Yes, if they get a negative lab-based PCR, they can return to school. I linked the decision tree in the chat just so everybody can see that again. Um, we we are seeing an uptick in flu too. So um, if someone is vaccinated and they start to have symptoms, it's always a good idea to go get tested because they might not be COVID. It could be flu or some kind of seasonal cold that's going around. Let's see. Is there any updates to how long household contacts need to quarantine? IDPH stated this Tuesday we can use 14 days with a negative RT-PCR test. Is this correct? Um, before I throw it to you, Michelle, I just want to say that um, for household members who are close contacts to a household case, their quarantine starts on the last day they've had contact with the infectious case. So if they are able to isolate away from the household case, then they can start their quarantine as soon as they're able to stay away from the case. If they're unable to, like it's a parent and a child or something like that, um, then their quarantine starts when the case's isolation ends. So um, you can use 14 days, which is the gold standard, from the end of isolation, or um, you can use um, earlier, uh, you know, uh, shortened quarantine periods. And then I will toss this to Michelle if you have anything to add to that. I just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page that the isolation and quarantine time are dependent on each other. Um, yes, Lex is correct. Um, I actually was on the Tuesday webinar from IDPH as well. And what Judy, I know IDPH and Judy was really trying for us to not do those super long quarantine. Sometimes they could be up to 24 days because that is a very, very long quarantine. Um, her recommendation is not for us to discount the fact that if there's a household case and someone has continuous exposure is to not discount, you know, that continuous exposure, but to really cancel that household on how they could safely isolate within the home. That might include separate bathrooms or cleaning before or after bathroom use and sleeping in separate bedrooms is kind of what she was indicating. Right, so if you want to shorten that um, isolation into quarantine period, steps need to be taken at home um, because studies have shown time and time again that COVID can really spread through a household very easily. Um, that is where it spreads the most. Um, sorry, I lost my place as we get <laughs> new ones. Let's see. Um, we have a parent that tested positive using a home test and has an unvaccinated student. Our district does not accept home tests. How do you suggest we proceed with a student's quarantine? Um, and I'm just gonna go ahead and answer this since it was on the slide. Um, if that parent didn't receive um, subsequent negative PCR results after this home test, then we have to treat their close contacts as close contacts as if they had a positive in something that wasn't the home test. So that student will need to um, quarantine as per they would typically do. All right, uh, this is a good question for Michelle. How often do you want us to update our spreadsheets that report cases or probable cases? If we have found new close contacts or results from probable cases, 
uh, negatives versus positives making new cases. So I guess, how often would you like them to update their line list, Michelle? Um, we actually would prefer once a day if possible. Um, if not, definitely within 72 hours. We did have one school that sent us 11 emails on update list per day. That's very excessive. So definitely no more than once a day. All right, the next question, with the new variant, are guidelines changing? Like for students who are considered close contacts and choose to do the seven day shortened quarantine and getting swabbed on day five, are both antigen tests and PCR tests still acceptable? Um, this is a good question. In general, um, guidelines are not changing. Um, and I think Judy said on the webinar um, on Tuesday that for that shortened quarantine, PCR tests are absolutely the preference. Michelle, do you know if we're accepting antigen tests still for early release from quarantine or is it only PCR? So currently we are accepting antigen tests and PCR tests for the seven days quarantine but IDPH already indicated that will change in the near future to be only lab-based PCR tests. We are actually waiting for IDPH to put the wording in their guidance before we make the change on our end. All right, also a good question from Michelle. We've had a few cases where a lab reissues a result that was originally positive and is now negative. Is it appropriate to accept a reissued reissued negative result after receiving initial documentation of a positive? Um, yes, absolutely. We actually have this in multiple diseases throughout the year that I've been working in communicable diseases. Those reissue STD tests are lots of fun. <laughs> yeah, so typically if a lab is reissuing results, it's because of some form of human error, not because you know, something magically happened to the actual person. Um, so if a lab decide a swab wasn't good enough or something was up with the way they process the test, absolutely, you can accept that reissued result. Uh, it looks like we've got another suggestion for collecting um, vaccine information. They're a high school district and they had parents submit vaccine cards through their usual registration process with a program called Skyward. Our nurses also take physical copies and upload as needed. And we also have devoted additional staff to our nurse's office to support the additional paperwork needs. Wow. It just warms my heart when <laughs> staff are there to support the nurse's office with the additional paperwork needs. My mom is a community nursing professor, and so to hear that support is really wonderful. Um, is there any update regarding if we can use the Binax now past the extended expiration date? I have been told two different things. Michelle, we've talked a lot about this with Dr. Corpix this week. Do you want to answer this? Um, yeah, sure. And I am sorry, because we were told two different things too. Um, about um, maybe two, three months ago, there was a test shortage where IDPH actually ran out of tests and they got permission from, I think, is it Medicaid, Medicare? I can't remember which department to use those tests past their expiration days, as long as they were um, kept correctly. But IDPH have indicated that they currently have sufficient testing and there's no reason to continue using expired tests because of that reason. All right, so the next question. We are seeing many vaccinated students testing positive for COVID at the high school level. What does the current data show for infection rates for vaccinated individuals? Um, so off the top of my head, um, some data that was released this week from Israel with booster doses, um, there was about a 6% uh, breakthrough infection rate among people who had two doses of the Pfizer vaccine and a little over 1% uh, breakthrough infection rate among those who had had a booster dose. So that was in Israel. It's a little different. Um, I report the... Um, breakthrough infections we see every day, and it's a little bit higher, but it's still a very rare occurrence. Um, 
especially for those who got mRNA vaccines. A couple of studies came out showing that Moderna and Pfizer vaccines were extremely effective. Um, I mean, especially effective at preventing hospitalization and severe disease and death, but still really good at preventing um, general infection. So it's not something that we're hugely concerned about, but it is something that does happen um, and it's something to pay attention to. If you're really concerned about it, like you think you might have an outbreak among vaccinated students, that's something we'd really like to hear about because that's a very unlikely event that we would need to investigate. Um, next question, is there any thought that new variants or updated travel guidance would change school's plan for in-person learning after the holidays? Um, I think the short answer is right now that guidance isn't going to change drastically, but there's a big, you know, asterisk about how fast we're detecting Omicron across the country. Um, the CDC said they were still discussing whether they were going to, um, uh, add guidelines for domestic travel about getting tested regardless of vaccination status. So. I don't think you have to worry about taking like adaptive pauses, but you may um, have a new like testing requirement if someone travels. Um, I think that would be the biggest change. Otherwise, you know, keep planning for what the current guidance is. Oh, and Kelly's on this call um, who works uh, on our COVID data, does an excellent job. Um, she answered Amy's question. Great, thank you so much, Kelly. Um, Dropping in the link for our feedback to the survey. Thank you again, Kelly. Um, and then looks like we have one last question. Um, I apologize for a repeat question. Can we use the seven day early release with negative PCR after day five for students that are close contacts and not household cases? Um, yes, uh, a negative PCR result uh, for the early release is fine. Um, and then uh, looks like Michelle, can you just say what you said about expired Binax tests one more time, just in case people missed it? Well, I think her question is if they could use um, the Binax now that's already expired, if they were not able to get replacement, if they were a cap, um, and I'm, I can't remember what the wording is, if, if they were kept correctly, you should be able to use them. In fact, there was a new memo, memo by Abbott Lab that I think extended all their tests out for one year anyways. I don't know if we even had those COVID tests for more than a year, to my knowledge. <laughs> so I'm hoping none of them were, I guess, more than a year out from expiration. All right. Um... I will toss it back to Kelly. If you guys have any more questions, pop them in the chat and I'll answer them before we go. But otherwise, I do want to do one more plug for our feedback survey. We want to make sure we are tailoring these presentations to what information you guys really need and would find useful. So um, if you have feedback, please let us know. Thanks, Lex. Before I um, wrap it up and then do a couple more updates for those who joined us late, I just want to make sure that there is a question in the chat that I saw a couple times asking for clarification for um, the slides. I don't know if that was answered or not. Did you answer that question? I answered it verbally. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. So if there are no other questions, thank you, Lex and Michelle and Kelly Looks for the like assistance. One other question. What? Um, and actually, this is a great question. Uh, I've seen this a couple times this week. Um, we had some confusion about how to count isolation days after the positive test. Is the positive test day zero or day one? Um, this is <laughs> this is basically just a difference in terminology. So, if you count the positive test day as day zero, then that person can return on day ten. So that is positive test day zero, they return on day 10. If you count the positive test day as day one, they have to return, like the, at the very last day of their isolation period is day 10 and they can return on day 11. So 
they're saying the same things. They just need to quarantine for a total of 10 days, regardless of the terminology. I hope that clarifies it for everybody. Um, it's just whether you're, you know, counting <laughs> uh, from 0 to 10 or from 1 to 11, basically. <laughs> Okay, thanks for that. Just waiting a bit to see if there are any more questions, but while we are waiting, just a reminder that um, the New Year's, I'm sorry, Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve falls on Friday. So we will be not, we will not be having our webinars during those weeks. So the 17th will be our last day until the new year. And for those who joined us later in the new year, we are making some changes to our webinar format. We will be back on January 7th for our first webinar of the new year. They will then be bi-weekly after that. So the changes have already been made in Eventbrite. If you go into Eventbrite to do your registration, they've already been changed. So just to let you know, we will keep repeating that the next few weeks so everyone is aware. If there are no other questions though, we will let everyone go and enjoy their weekend. Happy Friday. Can you share the Eventbrite link? Let me see if it's going to be in the email that I send Vanessa. I don't have it right on me, but when you get the, the link for the um, slides that I send, it'll have the Eventbrite link. So all of that is information will be on there and you'll get it all on Monday if there are no other questions. Okay. Thanks again to Lex and Michelle and Kelly for the assist. We will see you all next Friday. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you.